going to go to calls in just a moment, but let me mention that a little bit later on in this hour, we're going to have uh, Seth Abramson with us. He is author of a book called Proof of Conspiracy, How Trump's International Collusion is Threatening American Democracy. That'll give you a clue where Seth is coming from, <laughs> and we'll hear from him, and you'll be able to uh, offer your comments as well. Uh, but first, let's take a caller that she's been waiting a long time. Bonnie, listening to us in Crown Point, Indiana. Go ahead, Bonnie. Well, hello there, guys. Hi there. <laughs> um, okay, so the reason that I think that it's a great idea to require a full vote in the House there's, is twofold. The first reason is if they take a full vote, then the minority, that would be the Republicans, they get the right to subpoena witnesses, get evidence, etc. And then they can find out more information about this quote-unquote whistleblower and who has coached him, who prepared his statements, etc. That's the first thing. And, the, and, and what's really great is if, if a full vote is taken, all the Democrats that are in red districts have to go on record for voting for Trump's impeachment, and that will be political suicide. So that's my comment. Well, that's why uh, Nancy Pelosi doesn't like the idea. Uh, again, we're assuming that it's going to be political suicide. Uh, I doubt that it would be political suicide for all all of them. But uh, the other point I, the Democrats uh, referenced earlier, and that is it gives greater representation and greater uh, fairness uh, during the impeachment process. And I think the one thing that, that Jeannie mentioned a little bit earlier on is to have the ability to have, as part of your staff, uh, a, a, a not a balanced staff, but at least an input from the minority party. It makes sense. And again, we, we go back to the uh, the impeachment of uh, uh, Richard Nixon and Peter Rodino was the man in charge. And for Bill Clinton, it was Henry Hyde who basically was in charge. And the Democrats uh, had an opportunity uh, in each of those cases uh, uh, to to weigh in on, 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 on the process of that investigation and that inquiry. So I think that's exactly what should be done. The big question now, which we talked about just before the break, is whether or not whether we're not, whether or not we have in Adam Schiff, whether we have a a a man who has the the capability of conducting himself in a very nonpartisan way. I mean, he said, uh, told the American people last week that he had not had had any contact with the first whistleblower, and then it turned out to be the case that he did. Several weeks before it became public, he had that story. So again, he's told us a lie there. He was the guy that reminded us that he had evidence that was going to prove the conspiracy with the Russians. He told that story on national television for well over eight or nine months. That proved to not be true. And then when he gets this starring role to open a hearing, you know, he gives a parody of a conversation. He doesn't talk about the conversation itself. So to me, the, uh, Adam Schiff has three strikes and he's out. Uh, he is very partisan, and I don't think that's what we want right now, uh, even though I guess there's some people would say the Democrats have the votes. M maybe it's just Democrats that vote for impeachment. Would that be a good idea? D d would you be opposed to that? Well, what, what I wanted to say, you know, talking about Adam Schiff, if I could give an ex-cathedra pronouncement yeah. here. Uh, what's unfortunate about this is we elected a reality television star as president, and now he's pulled us all into the apprentice boardroom. Yes. And it seems as if every day we're living in under this tyranny of the small and the petty and the narcissistic. And while we're, and this is no disrespect to you, I understand why we have to have this conversation tonight, but while we're facilitating these conversations about impeachment and Adam Schiff lying and Donald Trump lying and our political system becomes paralyzed by this dysfunction. And meanwhile, we have millions of Americans without adequate health care, some of them dying for lack of insulin. We have millions of Americans going to dysfunctional, disgraceful schools and graduating functionally illiterate. We have millions of Americans who have less than $500 in their savings. You know, they're, they're one mishap or misfortunate away from financial ruin. We have uh, so environmental who's, who's problems. Who's fault we have. Is it, David? It's the fault of our in, the entire dysfunction of our political system. But what well, I, I I think you're right. I, yes, Bruno. but that, but you that's nothing you can fix quickly. Um, no, mean, of course not. Donald Trump I'm, is a is, is a symptom. 
he is not. Yes. And and what what I think is fascinating about the things that David just listed off. I mean, like. Uh, this is actually a pretty nice panel here, and if the four of us, we have two Democrats, mm -hmm. you have two Republicans, and, if, and you could vote as the tiebreaker, Bruce, if all of us were given the ability to run the country for four years, the five of us would probably be able to solve the problems doing some conservative things, some liberal things. We could probably do a pretty good job, but I don't think I can get that passed quickly. So what's interesting <laughs> about all of this is that I think Donald Trump is like the one person, like if... And he set things up in a certain way, and it's it, not necessarily all of it is his fault. But if if Pelosi and Schumer and the f two Republican leaders wanted to sit down and bang out some stuff to really be fixed, I actually think Trump, for all of his braggadocio and all of his character flaws, would be much more likely to actually solve a problem than the tepid kind of like Romneyism and Bushism. That I actually think there'd be a solution here. But I think that the minute. Pelosi and Schumer even try to talk to Trump about some solution for insulin prices, let's say, which incidentally, Trump is probably much more likely to take a harder line on pharmaceuticals That's than right. any other GOP person out there. That's right. He'd be cru the, those two leaders would be crucified by mm -hmm. the hardcore left who will not let anyone in their party talk to anybody any anything about uh, to Donald Trump about anything because they just don't want anything to pass. That is actually the that's one hundred percent the truth. This is full obstruction. Once they took over the Congress in twenty eighteen. Now listen, this has been a this has been Trump who's been attacked since November 9th, twenty sixteen. Relentlessly attacked. Remember the just the tears flowing. Hillary couldn't even give a you know a, a, a concession speech. She you know the fireworks didn't go off in New York City for her or anything like that. They could not believe it. And ever since then, they have been on the bandwagon to get rid of the president. And he sat through that with his Republican Congress. And what did he do? He did regular regulatory reform, which is still continuing. He did tax cuts. He did the USMCA, which still the Democrats refused to put uh, up for a vote and actually passed so that we have it in place. He's done so much good on the economic front, the lowest unemployment rate in 50 years, right? And you've had all this occur, and then what happened? They got control in 2018, and they will not let anything happen. And to Trump's credit, honestly, he looked at Pelosi and said, you, you know, after the, the Mueller report comes out, no collusion, no obstruction, despite whether you believe it or not, the official Mueller report, that is what occurred, no collusion, no, um, um, uh, what am I, sorry, no, sorry, no, well, no obstruction, no collusion, obstruction, but here's the point. After that, they still would not let it go. They would not let it go. They still wanted to impeach him and inquire more. Nadler was still after him, and that's what Trump said. You think I'm going to work on infrastructure for, with you when you're still investigating me? You had your 22 months of a report, $35 million, 500 people subpoenaed, thousands of pages of documents. You had everything to you, your you veil, and you really did not do it. And so why would he? Why would he work with these people when all they want to do is investigate him? He does want to get some things done. In fact, he'd probably get however, things done. Get he'd probably get things done on drug control. He probably, he probably however, wait a minute, he would probably get things done on price if, controls if for drugs were, that maybe are, isn't even a capitalist he, thing. If he because were, he's, if he not, to make a deal. he's not going to. They're not working with him. I'm Bruce Dumont, back shortly. Crooked. Back wrong. in Chicago, it is wrong. Uh, and uh, Peter, before the break, you were going to make a point following up on Jeannie, and then we're going to move on. So Jeannie mentioned, in terms of uh, the reluctance for the president to move on infrastructure at this point, I think. I mean, and he doesn't, as far as I as know, as long as they're investigating, he, he doesn't he listen to advisors. I mean, because I think you've seen the turnover there, and he's going to do what he's going to do, and that was, you know, I, I think was that. Let, let Trump be Trump, it was Corey Lewandowski or whoever said that, if he wanted to really take the wind out of the impeachment inquiry, you introduce the most robust infrastructure bill that no one could vote against who then has to run for re-election. But he won't get out of his own way. And I think that's what's so troubling if you are someone in that administration who believes in the party, who believes in our, in our government, 
And you say, look, we, I'm here to get something done. I could make a lot more money in the private sector if you would do that. That would be a legacy, particularly for someone who does develop real estate. But there is not going to be anything tangible at the end of his time in office. He will continue to debate on the media rather than put forth legislation that it would be politically damaging for someone, even of the opposite party, to vote against. How can you negotiate fairly with Pelosi, AOC, um, Sean Caston, you, you name it, Schiff, Nadler. How can you negotiate he with those have two to. Put when out they are at that is him? So enticing, uh, but no, but, but they are wants. they are at him. They are at him. And all he said is, "Why don't you do the first step? Why don't you take up the USMCA? Why don't you pass that trade agreement?" But whether and it's they the can't speaker, even take that. Representative Ocasio Cortez or Representative Caston, their primary job is to get reelected. And if they then would say, look, yes, he put forth this that would have is, pumped in $2.2 trillion anyone, in this economy, he won't do it the president's against position, his own best interest. The president's position, which I asked you at the beginning of the broadcast, David, and that is, I think Peter. if you ask the average American, who's not you know, a member of either particular mm -hmm. party, but they're out there, they're, they're watching this story, if, if they hear that the president, if... Members of Congress have to vote yes, proceed with the investigation, or close the investigation down. I think most voters think that's a fair question to ask of their member of Congress. I don't, I don't think they see that as an attempt to embarrass anybody or not embarrass anybody. Does everybody agree with that, or do you, just, or, or, or do you believe that they are thinking like Nancy Pelosi and they see it as a trick just to put some Democrats behind the eight ball. And framed that way, of course I agree with you. And I don't. And I'm not. And I'm not saying p what Pelosi's doing or what she's not doing. Who knows what she's going to do this next week or the next few days? We'll have to see what happens. Well, we got but another yeah, whistleblower, you, maybe a, more. Well, and so let's just see what happens. I just, I just, Trump could lose under very many scenarios. Trump could win under very many scenarios. It's going to be another one of those elections that's probably more similar to 2016 than anything else. We'll have to see what happens, but I just don't see this taking him down. Joe in LBJ in Austin, Texas, listening to us tonight. Go ahead, Joe. you got a question or a comment. Yes. Well, I have a comment. I was listening to your show shortly before 7 when you um, mentioned to go to YouTube and look at Chuck Todd finally loses it on the air with Ron Johnson. Yes, okay. I did that, and it starts in about the middle, I think, of the argument. Yes. It goes one minute and 42 seconds, and then a, a, a gentleman comes on by the name of Brian Cohen talking about this is just another TLC play. And it is the most biased thing I've ever seen on on YouTube with Chuck Todd. Mm -hmm. And there was there was nothing else about the interview. It's just this this gentleman ranting and raving about okay. the GOP. So maybe they cut it. So it can yeah it's, it? It, it, it's conceivable that they cut it. I mean I, I don't I don't have access to it right now, but usually you can go and you can watch NBCs, you can watch Meet the Press. Maybe they you know maybe they chose to cut it today because it was so embarrassing, you know. And then yeah, they, yeah. then the interview Absolutely. with John Brennan yeah. came along and that was that was way over the top. Listen, yeah, let, let me ask. You to look at it because you won't believe the, how biased. Well, that, that was my point. It's a very biased conversation. But uh, thank you very much for your call. I want to ask uh, everybody this question. The president said this week the Bidens are stone cold corrupt. Are Republicans? Do you believe that, Bruno? Well, I believe uh, every single one of them has been corrupt for the last fifty years, so that's not a hard question. <laughs> but I realize that that's kind of a cop out catch all. Um, you know what I think has so been so fascinating about these last few years, and it's not it was, it was going on before Trump, but it's gotten so much worse, is that we all live in our own. Uh, each there's there's a red universe and a blue universe, and the facts from the other universe just don't matter to us. So of course you talk to a Democrat, and everything Hunter Biden and Joe Biden did doesn't matter, no matter what, because it's there's it's nothing burger, there's nothing there. But this whistleblower, this whistleblower is going to take him down. He's going down. I'm telling you, it's it's all nonsense. I think a lot of stuff that Trump has probably done, I don't know what the, this book coming up is, is about, but I think a lot of stuff that Trump has done is probably bad or wrong. 
And of course, I think that Joe Biden, who seems to be one of those old time political hacks, similar to like Michael Madigan or your old school kind of guys, I'm sure he got his son a $50,000 a month sinecure where the guy's doing absolutely no work for nothing. Of course he did. And of course he probably went to China and got him another sinecure, which is the other thing coming up. But that doesn't matter in the blue universe. Only the whistleblowers let's, do. Let's, let's, Bruce, go the, right. let's go to the blue universe. I'm, I'm in the blue universe. And, you're the, yeah, you're the liberal portion of the blue universe, which the, normally the, you, would be, you would be appalled by that. The, the Biden story is a, is a perfect illustration of the repulsive and destructive corruption that has come to characterize the American political and economic experience. And there are, you know, I have students, I also teach at Indiana University Northwest, I have students going into debt to pay for a bachelor's degree in the hope that they can find suitable employment subsequent yeah. to graduation. Uh, I have students who they don't know how they're going to get adequate health care. Uh, I once had a student but, who but what was, do they say? I, I, my, my point to this, my point to this before I give, before I inundate you with examples of the precarity in which so many working class and middle class Americans live is that when people turn on the television or read the newspaper and read about Joe Biden setting up his loser pathetic son with this lucrative job, I, it outrages them because they realize that they have to work hard. They have to chuck and jive just to okay. just to get by. Right. And yet there's this corporate political nexus yes. of, yep. of connection and favor and wealth. Now let's, yeah, let's hear graft. From, okay, that's that's, that's, with, that's the liberal perspective. Well, and, 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 I, and by the way, I think that many people would agree with that. Well, and, Jeannie and you, was shaking her head. You make now, a good. Let's, no, let's I'm go nodding my head. head. I agree with and him. You were Absolutely. Shaking her head. Yes. Hunter yeah. Biden should have just gotten a job like anybody else. Well, yeah. you you make a good you make a good <laughs> point in terms Except of that he had red a universe charge. and blue yeah, universe, yeah. which could easily be red echo chamber, blue echo chamber. And I think if you were to almost strip these down to anonymous figures, and you say. You know, candidate A has a son who's doing business with Ukraine. Is that appropriate? You say, well, then candidate B has two Is sons it? who run a multinational organization. Peter, Peter let's Peter, deal. Peter, let, no, 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 let's deal with the fact. No, no, no. You have the vice president of the United States, the former vice president. The former vice. Well, I'm talking so, about what he did. I'm talking when about he, he was did. at the okay. time he was. The, did it. Let me finish. You have the vice president of the United States. Barack Obama is 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 his leader. Okay, he is given the responsibility of going to the Ukraine and giving the job and giving the responsibility of going to China to represent the United States. He's the point person there. And in one of these countries in Ukraine, there's a company that is being investigated as a corrupt company. And your son, while you're the vice president of the United States, he sits on their board and they pay him fifty thousand dollars a month. Yeah, you don't want now, to die you, on this hill. Are, are are you, no, no, no. Are you no, telling no, me no, that no, no, are no, you no. we had a, by the, the way, optics. we had a, we had a liberal here last <laughs> week. He saw nothing wrong with that. No, no, no. I'm I'm you I'm see something wrong with that. The optics are terrible. Thank the you. optics are terrible. Now, if there was criminal activity, Wait a minute. That, Didn't I don't know. say that. But 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 in terms of the optics, I agree. The optics are terrible when you have someone with that kind of. We had a Democrat last week who couldn't even say the optics were bad. Oh, the optics okay. are terrible. Bruce, Genie. I'm sorry. This is absolutely corrupt. First of all, Hunter Biden, admin discharge from the U.S. Army, or I'm sorry, Navy, Maybe. the Navy. Okay, for cocaine, he get, he pisses hot for cocaine. I mean, he should have had an other than honorable discharge at a minimum. What does that mean? He shouldn't be flying around with any. Vice president, I don't care if it's his if it's his father. He shouldn't get near him. You have that kind of charge against you. You're not getting near the president. I guarantee you. Guess why? Because when you want to go and even just do a meet and greet, even if it's a political thing, they're checking you out. They're finding out who you are. And he's flying off, and then he comes back with a hot shot job, and it sits on a board, and then he comes comes back from China with 1.5 billion dollar investment, and he knows nothing about what he's doing. It's completely corrupt. It's ridiculously corrupt, and and the fact that they won't go after him now, I think this is this is a travesty. Wait, 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 I wouldn't want. Even acknowledge, I would even wait that too. I would not. I would. I would not want Donald Trump to come over to my house for dinner, 
nor any of his derelict kids, nor would I want Hunter Biden over at my house for okay. dinner. Well, and, yet, and, and yet, <laughs> no, and, none of them are going, and, David. And, and yet, <laughs> we have to d- debate whether or not these people are going to go into the White House. Some of them are already there. No, no, no. It's, but Hunter it's Biden tragic for was, our country. Hunter Biden was not elected. He was no, given this as a privilege. No, but he would be part of the first family he if was Joe Biden won. Second family, yeah. It's ridiculous. You're right. You're right. And, and, but, all, but I, and all the stories that we've heard for the yeah, last three years about the, the Trump, about the Trump children, we will hear it again about Hunter Biden because we already know he's got a past. We'd like to know a little bit more about it, but it doesn't look like a very, it doesn't look like a squeaky clean uh, record. And again, the Democrats, they always like to be squeaky clean. When we come back, a book about Donald Trump that you may or may not like. None of us would hire Hunter but Hunter Biden. Bruce Dumont back in Chicago. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, In this segment of the program, we're going to be joined by uh, author Seth Abramson. And uh, Seth has written a book called Proof of Conspiracy, How Trump's International Collusion is Threatening American Democracy. And Seth joins us from the University of Wisconsin. Seth, nice to have you with us tonight. Is he not there? He's not there. Well, I guess uh, you're not going to be there. Never mind. Okay, well, the you may join us. The spooks got him. The, yeah, the spooks got him. <laughs> <laughs> I want Trump to go back him. to something that, that, that we were talking about a little bit earlier <laughs> on the program, and, and that is the difference of opinion we have from the right side of the table, from at least one portion of the left side of the table, and, and that is the degree to which uh, the president of the United States should trust the CIA and the FBI. Mm-hmm. I think most people would agree that in in a in a perfect world, it would be nice if the president of the United States could trust the honesty and the integrity of that of those branches of government. Does everybody agree with that? Absolutely. You know, Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yes. Now, in your view, or or I think in the president's view, the president during the campaign made statements that he did not believe in the wisdom, the almighty wisdom of of the CIA. He referenced the bad information they gave to George Bush, which led to to the war in Iraq. So uh, he was on record of saying that. He was on record as saying that he wanted a, he wanted a new deal with the, with the Russians. He didn't think we should automatically be at each other's throats. So the American people knew of these things. So when he becomes the president elect of the United States, how how should he have gone about trying to separate out from the FBI and the CIA information coming in from them through James Comey and the, the head of the CIA at the time? How does he, how does he separate out information received from them when you have already challenged the integrity of them? during the campaign. Jeannie, I want to start with you. Well, we also have the Defense Intelligence Agency that he can rely on. We have the National Security Agency that he can rely on. So you have other ways that you can triangulate the information that you're receiving about whether or not the the, the information that they've provided for you, the CIA or the FBI, is accurate or not. But, I mean, but he was been, right but, but they, to but, be suspect. But they had been challenged as well mm-hmm. from by Trump because the other agencies that you referenced were so, part of the group right. that had uh, had warned of Russian involvement. Look, it did not take very long where you had the first time where, he, where private conversations that he had, and I thought it was with Australia, that were leaked, right? Remember that? So he's uh, he is already very early in his administration not able to trust some of those folks. So, you know, the minute that that happens, you have to be very, very suspicious about everything that comes before you. So I think that uh, from the get-go, he knew that there were people in that administration well, that were against him. It would help, him. however, if, if Trump was a, a more studious man, to put it <clears throat> politely. He's not. I mean, but we I mean, don't know that. No, we well, get well, reports well, that he's not that? reading he was, his daily briefings. But he, he was elected with us knowing How do we know that? all yes. of that. And yes. so, I mean, I would think it's the same way if you criticize the FDA. 
I would still have comfort going to the grocery store and buying produce, even if I have openly criticized them because I would believe that there is a professional commitment to those who have chosen that field that right. is more important than my criticism, even if I am on that That's, pedestal. You're okay. talking leadership. Okay. If he was a more astute intellectually well, disciplined leader at the CIA and the but FBI. Again, what, he what, could separate what, the fact and fiction, but what we're, the machinations but, but from no, the... No, but you have to rely about, on intelligence what, what we're reports talking about, because you can't gather them yourself. Right. Folks, what we're talking about now is we're talking about what many Americans believe, at least those that supported Donald Trump, they believe there has been a, an ongoing conspiracy against Donald Trump. Our guest right now, Seth Abramson, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, Seth, it's nice to have you with us uh, because you have written a book called Proof of Conspiracy, which, again, probably would have got 100% of the people saying, oh, that sounds a good idea because I believe in conspiracy. Uh, your subtitle, however, is How Trump's International Collusion is Threatening American Democracy, which sort of gives away uh, at least the, uh, uh, you know, at least where you're going in this book. L let me ask, when you began the book, did you have this as a con conclusion already or did the conclusion in the subtitle come as you learned information? Actually, what happened is I wrote a book in 2018 called Proof of Collusion. And during the course of writing that book, I discovered that there was a substantial part of the story of Trump's international collusion that I wasn't really covering in that book that involved the Middle East. And I started investigating that issue. I spent about a year curating hundreds and hundreds of major media reports from around the country and going back decades, I approached the question as an attorney and as someone trained as a criminal investigator. So it wasn't as I researched the book or as I wrote the book, my responsibility to consider how people might receive it from a political standpoint, but to think about the investigation that had been done in criminal investigative work, but also in investigative journalism. And it suggested there was, in fact, a six-nation a six deal prior to the 2016 election that uh, led to collusion between not just the Trump campaign in Russia, but also with Israel, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Egypt, and the United Arab Emirates. Okay. So your book goes well beyond uh, U.S. involvement with Russia. Your book deals with the, the, the beginning of your story basically goes back to Saudi Arabia at the core. I, explain the, the nations that you believe are involved in this conspiracy and how did they bring Donald Trump, the candidate, into that conspiracy? Well, and just so I can be very clear, this isn't a question of what I believe. I don't think what I believe is material. This is a question of what investigative journalists from around the world have discovered, what criminal investigations have uncovered, and what they've uncovered. And this is reported in major media outlets in the United States and around the world, is that in the fall of 2015, there was a meeting on the Red Sea on a yacht that was convened by George Nader, a future Trump advisor and now a federal witness and defendant. And that meeting on the Red Sea in the fall of 2015 that George Nader convened included the leaders of Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Egypt, who were looking for an American politician to partner with to advance a very particular design that they had that also involved and Israel. And what was developed at that point was what is referred to by, frankly, Michael Flynn himself as the grand bargain, which sometimes calls it the Middle East Marshall Plan, which involved the ripping up of nations on Russia by the United States. Seth, Seth I, I'm going to... By the United States. Seth, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you here. Uh, we have a very bad uh, audio connection uh, on this Skype interview. I don't want to. I don't want you to miss the the relevance of your comments. So what I'm going to suggest, and my engineer is listening, and the director is listening to this. We're doing it live on the fly now. I'm going to end the Skype conversation now because of the bad quality. We're going to call you back on the good old fashioned telephone in a couple of minutes. We'll continue the conversation on the phone because I don't want your comments to be lost. Okay. Thank you. So sure. we're going to end the Skype, and uh, uh, Andrew, let's uh, get back on the phone, and let's get him, as soon as you get him on the phone, let me know, and we'll go back uh, to an old-fashioned uh, uh, interview uh, like that. Um, so his premise goes back to something about the Middle East in Saudi Arabia. 2050. It, it, be it begins with a conspiracy yeah. involving uh, the Saudis and the Emirates and, and Israel, and uh, basically it deals uh, with an attempt uh, to really uh, defang Iran. This is a conspiracy that begins to, to really go 
going after Iran, and they need a they need someone who is going to uh, uh, take on the who is going to be able to convince the Russians uh, to uh, to you know back away from their support of Iran. What's and this in the conspiracy campaign, in that then? What's the well, conspiracy? the conspiracy is when they engage Donald Trump, uh, he gets involved in this because of past deals that he has had with this with this group of people. That's the essence of uh, the summary. Let's go back. Seth, are you back with this on the phone? Yes, I am. Hi. Okay, good. This is much better. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, let, let's bring Donald Trump. How does Donald Trump fit into this group of, uh, uh, of, of those from the Middle East uh, who, had, who, who had gathered together to basically try to defang Iran? Sure. So in the summer of 2015, uh, Donald Trump did not have a foreign policy. That was the point at which Michael Flynn entered into his orbit in August of 2015. Mm -hmm. The two met, and shortly thereafter, Donald Trump had a comprehensive foreign policy in the Middle East that was based upon what Michael Flynn had been working on in the spring of 2015 and the summer of 2015, which was this grand bargain involving Russia, Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, and Egypt, specifically, as I mentioned before, the ripping up of the Iran nuclear deal, the ripping up of Russia sanctions, but also importantly, a joint U.S.-Russia nuclear deal that would lead to the building of nuclear reactors all across the Middle East. And that became Donald Trump's foreign policy in its summit substance beginning in the fall of 2015. And what was Donald Trump supposed to do as part of his uh, piece of the bargain? Well, he was supposed to do, Bruce, exactly what he did. He was supposed to rip up the Iran nuclear deal, okay. even if Iran was in compliance, which is what he did. He was okay. supposed to seek to rip up Russia sanctions, which we learned from The New York Times was, in fact, his plan when he entered office. And he was only stopped from doing so by career officials at the State Department that put a stop to it. But since that time, he has not, in fact, leveled against Russia all the sanctions that he could have. He has actually dragged his feet at every possible chance. So there's no question that there were parts of this deal in terms of what Donald Trump was supposed to deliver that he was not able to deliver on. But all of the evidence from major media reporting indicates that he did deliver on what he could. He tried to deliver on what he could not and that he received benefits, including, as we know from the Mueller report, negotiating a multi-billion dollar real estate deal with the Kremlin in the fall of 2015, as he was telling American voters that he had no ties to the Russians. Mm. Now, also, when we come back, I want to talk a little bit more about uh, Jared Kushner. He has an integral role to play uh, in the charges that you're making. And again, uh, we thank you for joining us tonight. The name of the book is Proof of Conspiracy. Seth Abramson joins us from the University of Wisconsin. back in Chicago, and uh, we're joined by Seth Abramson. And, uh, Seth, one thing in the book, if you want to elaborate, is that uh, uh, in, the, in the Mueller report, which looked into the relations between uh, the Trump and Donald Trump and Russia, it really didn't get into any other countries. Is that correct? So, so the, what you're talking about was not investigated by Mueller at all? Uh, that's partly true. On page 10 of volume one of the Mueller report, Robert Mueller indicates that all information that touched on counterintelligence was actually reserved and held back from the Mueller report and instead referred to the FBI counterintelligence division. So I suspect, based upon New York Times and Washington Post and Wall Street Journal reporting, that much of what we are discussing now, in fact, was investigated by Robert Mueller, but then it was referred to the FBI counterintelligence division and not included in the report per page 10 of volume one. So we may hear more about that at some point in the future? Absolutely. We found about a month ago, we learned that Adam Schiff had, for the first time in two years, actually gotten a briefing from the FBI Counterintelligence Division. Adam Schiff, I should say, and the rest of the House uh, Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. I'm not sure why it took two years for the FBI Counterintelligence Division to bring the House up to speed on what had been referred to it by Robert Mueller, but we do know that that briefing happened. We understand that there's been, I believe, at least one additional briefing since then. So eventually some sort of report should be issued either by the FBI or by the HPSCI. 
And you also, uh, in the book, you reference that uh, the famous, uh, infamous Steele dossier uh, that, according to your investigation, there's certain aspects of the, of the report, of the uh, dossier, that were accurate. What was accurate in the Steele dossier? Well, I think the important thing to note first is that nothing in the dossier has been conclusively disproven. There have been many articles in major media about the elements of the uh, Trump-Russia investigation that ended up conforming with the, uh, the Steele dossier. For instance, the role that Michael Cohen played in outreach between Trump and Russia, the role that Paul Manafort played, the way that certain payments were made to Russian agents, the fact that there were meetings in neutral cities in European countries between Trump agents and agents of the Kremlin. I mean, the list really goes on and on. There are certainly some elements of the Steele dossier that are still being investigated that we still don't know if they're correct or not. But the important thing to remember for those who attacked the Steele dossier is that when uh, Christopher Steele gave over the dossier, he indicated that he believed because it was raw intelligence that still had to be processed, that about 75, perhaps 70 percent of it was accurate, 30 percent of it, as with all raw intelligence, when looked at more, might be determined to be inaccurate. But that's how intelligence works. And I do think we found that about 70 percent, possibly more of the Steele dossier, has proven to be accurate. And the funding of the dossier, uh, do you deny that it came from uh, Democratic sources? What I believe was testified to before Congress by Glenn Simpson of Fusion GPS is that he hired Christopher Steele, who worked for Orbis, as an independent contractor. And at the time that Christopher Steele did his work, he had no idea who his client was or who he was doing research for. Fusion GPS, prior to working with Christopher Steele uh, as someone who was distantly being paid by a Democratic law firm, had, as you know, Bruce, been working with the Republicans. So, in fact, much of what Christopher Steele came across that ended up in his dossier he actually determined, while he was, perhaps unbeknownst to him, being paid by Republican sources. Thereafter, we, he was then paid by Democratic sources. During that period when he was uh, allegedly being paid by Republican sources, do we know uh, specifically how that derogatory information about Donald Trump was going to be used? Again, there was a 17-person primary going on. Was there someone in that primary that was behind uh, this uh, investigation? Well, the payments were being made by the Washington Free Beacon, a right-wing publication. Uh, it's believed that there were individuals who may have been behind the funding of that effort who supported other candidates. Mm -hmm. Major media reporting suggests that at least one of the candidates they were supporting was Jeb Bush. We have a report in the right-wing Daily Caller that says that in the early fall of 2015, not 2016, but 2015, there was, in fact, discussion in Republican circles about potential compromise involving Donald Trump at the Ritz Moscow Hotel in November of 2013. And again, this was information reported by the Daily Caller that Christopher Steele derived from his MI6 related sources in Russia in 2015 while he was being paid by Republicans. So what is, is this the, most the is this is this, Seth, is this dossier was this, in fact funded by Republicans. Okay, so this is the sexual uh, salacious stuff in the hotel room with prostitutes. That part of the Correct. story? that's the allegation. Okay. A, a, a question. We have been discussing here uh, on the program before you joined us how the American people, how are they supposed to believe the CIA, the FBI, when many Americans in this country who may be supporting of Donald Trump or, uh, you know, old, old progressives from uh, the 60s, they don't trust the intelligence community. As a journalist, as a reporter, as, a, as, as an academic... How do you answer the question right now, and, and how do you deal with the fact that if you pick up something from the intelligence community, how, how you know it's true or not true? Well, I was a public defender for many years, so I did battle with the government over Americans' constitutional rights every single day for years and years. So I'm as circumspect as anyone is about law enforcement. What I would note is that the Republican Party has a roughly 50-year history of being supportive, broadly speaking, in its rhetoric of law and order. I think it's very interesting that suddenly when law enforcement is reporting out information that Republicans are unhappy with, there appears to be a wholesale assault on the CIA and the FBI. You mentioned progressives from the 60s who have long been critical of law enforcement. 
I think they also should continue to be consistent and should have that skepticism. Now, the way that skepticism is addressed is that what you have with an uh, investigation of this size is that you have many redundancies built in. You have people checking other people's work. You have many investigators. Seth, just on Mueller's team alone, you had 40. Seth, we're out of time. I've got to uh, say thank you very much, other than just to summarize that when we talk about law enforcement, I think a lot of people understand what law enforcement is. When you sort of throw it all in with the intelligence community, it sort of mucks it up. They know the cop on the street. They know the uniformed officer. They know the FBI. But again, when you're talking about intelligence, uh, it's a little more than just uh, law enforcement. It's sort of the intelligence community. Listen, thanks very much. The title of the book is Proof of Conspiracy, How Trump's International Collusion is Threatening American Democracy. Seth, for, thank you for joining us. And also thanks to our guests around the table this evening. I'm Bruce Dumont. And thanks to Andrew Marshall and also to Fritz Goldman for their assistance in the production of this program. Until next week, good night from Chicago. Crooked teeth.